Father, we are so thankful that we could be here. We are so grateful for the privilege it was ours to serve children this week. And we would pray that as they heard the gospel over and over again, you would cause it to be planted deep in their little hearts. You would bring them to a genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ, and you would cause them to be rooted and grounded in him and grow to be faithful disciples. We pray, Lord, that your word would go through them and the lessons they learned, the songs that they sang, the verses they memorized, even to reach out to their siblings and their parents and neighbors and friends and schoolmates that in the months to come, more and more would hear the good news of Jesus. And now as we come before you to look into the word of God again and to study more about the armor you provide for us, we thank you, Lord, that you are our protector. You are the rock we stand on. You are the one who delivers us. So we look to you to teach us how to appropriate your resources and to walk in victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please be seated if you would and join me back in Ephesians chapter 6. My dad died a few years ago. If he was still alive, today would have been his 98th birthday. And I was thinking about that a lot this week and just kind of reminiscing on what my childhood was. I had a great childhood. Did you all have a good, great childhood? I sure did. I, my dad took such great care of us, and we had a blast. And I was remembering that as a kid, I didn't always get what I wanted, but I desperately wanted PF flyers. Do you remember those? PF flyers. Here's a picture. Do we have a picture of that, Greg? He's, he'll find it. He's trying. Okay. He's trying. The computer is trying. You know, that just happens all the time. But I have some photos up there, hopefully in a minute, of the PF Flyers. It sounds familiar to some of you who weren't living back then because in 2001, New Balance bought them out and has brought some retro PF Flyers back onto the market. It was actually originated in 1933. B.F. Goodrich patented something called the Posture Foundation, which was an insert in the shoe that would cause your posture to be corrected, and that became a very famous thing in shoes, very popular. And then they employed a Canadian badminton player named Jack Purcell, who designed a, a shoe for playing badminton that was canvas with rubber. Well, by 1944, PF Flyers were releasing their first kid, there they are, their first kid's collection of shoes, and they created the slogan, remember this? Run faster, jump higher. Any of you remember that? Okay, three of you, that's pretty good. Well, in 1958, they hired the legendary Boston Celtics basketball player, Bob Cousy, to be their, their representative and that year, with his marketing strategy, they sold 14 million PF Flyers. It became so popular, they then started a kind of a comic magazine, book, comic book series, called the PF Magic Shoe. And then they had a Saturday morning TV special. By the 1970s, PF Flyers were so ubiquitous that they found their way into standard issue infantry uniform in the U.S. Army. You believe that? There they are. The U.S. Army was wearing that shoe out in battle. Isn't that wild? And I was thinking about that. How cool to wear the tennis shoes that the U.S. Army is wearing. That's why I wanted them. I wanted those shoes. And I was thinking about how soldiers, soldiers don't typically go to war barefoot, do they? I mean, if you live in a tribal village area, you might, but mostly modern warfare, they wear very special gear from head to toe. And the shoes are critical. It's such a vital thing to have the right shoe on if you're going to be able to stand firm in the battle. And that's where Paul brings us as we look today in Ephesians chapter 6. He was thinking about the kind of armor that soldiers around him wore, as well as some metaphorical descriptions of the coming Messiah from the Old Testament. And as he wrestled through that, he began envisioning what is the things we need to put on to appropriate God's strength so we can stand firm and resist the devil and his demonic forces. And so that's what he was thinking about. And we talked a couple times ago about the belt of truth, more of a girdle kind of a thing that would go around your waist and would hang down. I think we have a, a picture of that. And it would come down and would protect from your waist down to about your knees. 
And this thing was the belt of truth. This is the truth of the Word of God, both written and the living Word of God, Jesus Christ. That is our protection. We must be surrounded by truth because the enemy's main way of attacking is through lies. He's a liar. He always has been a liar and a deceiver and a slanderer. He's always sharing things that are not true. Sometimes it's partially true. Just enough to make you think it's true and then lead you off until you're off to oblivion. We looked at that and how that's the first one you've got to put on because everything else attaches to or flows out of that. Truth is our foundation in spiritual warfare. Then we also looked at the second one, which was having the breastplate of righteousness. So we have objective truth of the Word of God and the breastplate of righteousness. We said this is not our righteousness. If our righteous deeds are filthy rags in the sight of God, they also are to the devil. In our greatest moment, the most righteous thing we have ever done never met God's standard of perfection. Isn't that true? Have you ever done anything perfectly? Not once. And so we're not going to go defeat the devil by showing how righteous we are, but we can stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen? He was perfect righteousness, and that righteousness was imputed to our account. So here he's talking about justification by faith alone. Nothing I can add to it. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and the finished work of Jesus Christ alone, that we find in the scriptures alone to the glory of God alone, right? Those are the solas that we believe in. So we are rooted in that, and that breastplate protects from the neck down to the waist. All of our vital organs where thought, emotion, and volition take place. That's where the devil wants to attack you. He wants to attack your thinking. He wants to attack your emotions. He wants to attack your choices. And that's where we need to be protected by the righteousness of Christ. Praise God we have that, that no matter what attack he brings our way, no matter what kind of slanderous statements he brings, no matter how many accusations he brings toward us, and he does that day and night, doesn't he? Anybody here struggle with guilt, shame, fe feeling like a failure? And when that happens, what you say to the devil is, you know what, devil? I am not a child of God based on anything I have done. I am a child of God because of what Christ alone has done. And I am his forever, and you can't change that. Nobody can, right? Right? I am in his hand and nobody can snatch him out because his righteousness has been imputed to my account. God will always see me as righteous. Are you grateful for that? When he looks at you, is he aware of our sin? Of course he is. He knows, he sees, but he is committed to taking you on into eternity because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. What a grateful thing to know, isn't it? So I don't have to be worried about his thoughts. I don't have to fear death. When I'm there about ready to take my last breath, I may not be happy about the way I die, but I know that after I die, I will be with Christ forevermore. And you can know that too. So we can resist the devil on that one. But that then brings us to the third one. Since we're protected from the knees to the neck now with those two items, what do we do on the lower extremities? And this is where he then brings up the shoes of the gospel of peace. He says, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, this is where many commentators take this to be a subjective thing. They take this to mean that my shoes, I'm actually putting on the shoes of being prepared to go preach the gospel. This is where I'm going to go out and share the good news with anyone and everyone. I'm going to tell them about peace. They often say that because of Isaiah 52, verse 7. In that passage where it says, How lovely on the, on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. That same verse is quoted in Romans chapter 10, speaking about how preachers need to go out and preach the good news so that people can hear the gospel and respond by faith and be saved. But I don't think that's what he means here. You see, what he's saying here, it really has nothing to do with that in the context. The context here is not going. The context is what? Standing. I'm standing firm. I'm not going somewhere. I am standing firm. I'm not preaching the gospel. I'm fighting the devil. I'm not evangelizing demons. I'm resisting them. I'm not evangelizing the, evangelizing the lost. I'm protecting the saved. That's what's going on here. It's a stance. It's appropriate in God's resources to stand. Now, 
Is proclaiming the gospel something that every Christian has been mandated to do by our Lord and Savior? Of course it is, but not in this passage. This passage is about something else in its context. So let's break down the passage, and I want to show you why I've come to that conclusion. And you can argue with me if you want. That's perfectly fine. I enjoy a good debate. He says, first of all, that this is the gospel. The word gospel means good news. This is the good news of peace. Well, what does that mean? So I took a little time to look up this word peace. It's the Greek word eirene. This word I found to be used 91 times in the New Testament. Now think about that for a moment as you're thinking, why doesn't Pastor Paul hurry up and get through this? Because I looked up 91 verses this week on this word peace, and I'm not in a hurry. If God said something 91 times, do you think he wants us to get a deeper understanding of it? I think he does. By the way, the Greek word eirene flows out of a Hebrew word you might be familiar with, shalom. So that same concept it has a lot of varied meanings, but there's a specific meaning here. Eight times it's used in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 2, 2, 14, 15, and 17, 4, chapter 4, verse 3, chapter 6, verse 15, and 23. Let's look at just one. Let's go backwards a little bit to Ephesians 2, 14 through 17. And there where the apostle is talking about how the gospel brings unity to the church where Jew and Gentile come together in Christ, he says, verse 14, referring to Jesus, for he himself is our what? Our peace, who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, that warfare, that struggle, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing what? Peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the what? The cross. By it, having put to death the enmity. What did Jesus do when he died on the cross? He got rid of the warfare. It ended. There is no more struggle. There is no more battle. There's peace. He says he put to death the enmity, and he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Jesus came pe preaching peace. He came and he preached that he was peace that salvation was through him. We see it all through the New Testament. He came to be our way of peace with God, Luke 1, and 2, 14 say. Even talking about him before he was born, he was the one that was going to bring peace. Almost 700 years before he was born, Isaiah the prophet said his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, the prince that brings peace, the prince who governs peace. He was going to come and bring that. Jesus himself used this word frequently. He constantly talked about peace. In Matthew 10, 13, when he sent out the 12 to preach, he told them that if they went to a house in a particular city and that house received them, that they were supposed to put their blessing of peace on that house. In Matthew 5, Luke 7, and Luke 8, he healed people and then told them, go in peace. What a great concept. There's no war anymore. You now have put your faith in me. You can now go in peace. In John 14, 27, he offered a peace that the world cannot give. And in John 16, 33, he said, These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Caught between a rock and a hard place. You're going to get smashed to smithereens in the world. But not me. I'm going to give you my peace. And by the way, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I can get you through. If you're at peace with me, everything else is okay. Isn't that great news? In John 20, verse 19, when he rose from the dead and he appeared to the disciples, were they exactly on fire right after he died? What, where were they? Hiding in a room. Why? It says in that text, because of the fear of the Jews. They're hiding in a room with the doors locked. And Jesus didn't need a key. He just went right through the wall. And he comes in and he says, peace be with you. What a great thing to hear, isn't it? All of a sudden you think we followed this guy and now the whole world's against him. The whole world's against us. And then he appears and says, don't worry. You got peace. John 20, 21, he did the same thing. 
Actually, he did it in verse 26. He did the same thing when Thomas was present the second time. But in John 20, 21, he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Be at peace, guys. I'm going to send you out into the world, and you're going to go make a difference, and I'll be right there with you the whole time. He is over and over. In the book of Acts in chapter 9, the church in Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace. They were built up, and instead of fearing the world, they were going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and the church grew. In chapter 10, verse 36, Peter all of a sudden is told to go to the house of a Gentile, Cornelius, and he goes there thinking, are you kidding me? We hate each other. We've been at war with Gentiles ever since the beginning. What are you thinking about sending me to this Gentile? And he goes there, and all of a sudden, after the vision of the sheet coming down and all the stuff that he does, Peter realizes that God sent them preaching peace through Jesus Christ because he is Lord of all. Everybody. In Acts 15, messengers of the gospel were sent on to other places in peace. Now, when you get to all the New Testament epistles... Here's where it gets fascinating. Have you ever noticed how often every, almost virtually every epistle starts with peace? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, grace and peace. But many of them also end with a benediction of God's peace. I, I'm thinking maybe there's something we've missed here. Do you often run around, I mean, other than when, like in the 60s when you ran around and said, peace, man, you know, I'm not talking about that, right? Peace, not war. Okay, I'm talking about, have you ever thought of speaking to your brothers and sisters in Christ and just rejoicing with them that they are at peace with God? Anybody here discouraged? Anybody here? Nobody? Oh, there's a few of you. You're, you're too discouraged to raise your hands. I can see that. <laughs> when you're discouraged, don't you like to hear something cheerful? Be reminded that there's actually something good going on in the world? When you are struggling and the enemy's pounding on your head what a failure you are and times are tough, could be physical, could be financial, could be relational, isn't it good to know that God's not mad at you? He's not. The war's over. It's over. Think about that for a minute. Now, the moment you were made at peace with God, you instantly became the enemy of the devil. But he's temporary. I was thinking about how we have like some big people in our church. Is David here today? David is here. David, stand up, would you, just for a moment? <laughs> David's my dear friend and brother. We've known each other for a lot of years now, right? David's a fairly, fairly large human being. <laughs> what are you, like 6'11 and 3 quarters, something like that? With the tennis shoes? Seven feet, seven feet with the shoes on, with the PF flyers? Yeah, okay. If you, if you grow the fro, then you're seven. Okay, I get it. If you ran into David in a dark alley, you might be intimidated. Right? But now imagine if David wanted to attack me, but the God of the universe stood in between. By the way, the whole universe fits in his hand. He can palm a basketball, David, right? Okay. You, you can sit down, my friend, because you're, you're too intimidating when you're standing. <laughs> you think about these people, then on a human scale, you think about when David fought Goliath. David may not have had a real peaceful feeling necessary, because we know the soldiers around him certainly didn't. But when David realized who was on his side, he could go up against anybody. He could stand firm. Amen? We've got to understand this. That when we have this peace with God, we can do anything. And so I believe that most of us need to hear this more often. Peace. You have peace. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? There's words going through your head, maybe even right now. But the reality of it is, the Bible makes a declaration as we're going to see about this peace. Go ahead and read through the epistles. Go ahead and read through all of them. We're going to cover a few verses today, but... So much of the time, the Bible says over and over, peace, peace, peace. I spoke at our uh, breaking ground camp a couple summers ago with our youth, our college and singles, and I was really surprised to find that one of the biggest struggles with folks in that age group is anxiety, fear, worry. It's a real problem today. 
Why? They don't have a, a basis for being at peace. The enemy is attacking big time. Many of you are experiencing that. It's a big problem, would you agree? Oh, how we need to understand peace. We need to be encouraged by peace. So maybe as you greet one another day, you might give each other a hug and say, grace to you in peace. You're, you're right with God. Everything's okay in the world. Amen? So now having said that, I want to go and look at some specifics. Obviously, peace can be used in a number of ways. You can say, I have a peace about it. That's a, a sense of well-being. You might say, the river is peaceful today, describing a period of calm. Or you might say, peace, not war. And that's really the use here in Ephesians 6. The war's over. There's no more war. See, the gospel of peace says that I am at peace with God. Now, to the Greeks, even prior to the New Testament era, this word, word irene denoted primarily a state of being, not a relationship or attitude. I am in a state, I am in a condition of peace, and nothing can change that. We have signed a treaty. God and I will never, ever, ever, ever be at war again. Is that good news? Think about that. We are at peace. Ephesians 2, the bad news is we were at war. Here's even the worst news. Some of you sitting in here today or watching by live stream, some of you may be at war with God right now, and you don't even realize it. See, when Jesus came to the people of his day, and he challenged them, and he spoke to the Jewish people, the most religious people on the planet, and he warned them that they were on a broad path that leads to destruction. Who is the destroyer? God. God is the one who's going to pour out his wrath on sinners. God is the one who's going to cast them into hell forever and ever. Satan doesn't rule hell. God does. And they are enemies with God. And if that doesn't change, they're in big trouble. And my heart would bleed for you. If there's anybody here and you're a religious person, you've gone to church for years, you've taught, you've done all these things, but you have not embraced Christ yet. He is not your righteousness alone. If you haven't done that, then you're still at war with God no matter how religious you may be. But the good news is peace is available. Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 3, you were by nature children of wrath. Ephesians 2, verse 12, you were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Romans 5, 9, and 10, at one time you were God's enemies, destined to experience his wrath forever. Isaiah 57, 21, Isaiah the prophet records, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. <laughs> but you talk to people today and they don't think it's a big deal. Oh yeah, God, you know, the, the big guy upstairs, yeah, we're good, we're good, we're good, we're good, you know, we're like this. Really? On what basis? Well, what, what do you normally hear? Well, because I'm a good person, my good outweighs my bad, etc. We saw last time that just doesn't help. God's standard is perfect righteousness. If you don't have perfect righteousness, you're still at war. This is a problem. It's a huge problem. In Psalm 2, for those who think it's not a big deal, the psalmist David writes, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. These are verse three verses. This is the nations of the world shouting out at God, we don't have to do what you say. We're just going to tear off all your rules, all your laws, all your stuff, and we're just going to go do our own thing. And there's not one single thing you can do about it. Verse 4, God who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord, he said to me. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations in your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth is your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. 
God the Father says, all right, I'm going to put my son on the throne. You've mocked everything else. You've tried to resist every other king I've put on the throne, but I'm going to put my son on the throne, and he's omnipotent. And you're going to have to repent and come to him, or he is going to destroy you. Is that scary? It should be. But God graciously then says in verse 10, Now therefore, O king, show discernment, take warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence, rejoice with trembling, do homage to the Son that he not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Oh, don't run away from Jesus thinking you're going to get away with it. Someday he's coming. And he is going to judge the earth. He's going to judge everybody. We're all going to stand before him. And instead of running from him, you've got to run to him. You've got to go to him and say, Jesus, I'm so sorry for my lawlessness, my rebellion, my worshiping of my own opinions. I need your forgiveness. And you come to him and you find refuge. Because he forgives you. He takes your sin away and imputes his righteousness to your account and gives you peace. Isn't that great news? But so many people don't think it's a big deal. They often have a view of God that he's some nice grandfather in the sky who would never hurt anybody. But the Bible speaks of God as the omnipotent, wrathful, furious, jealous God, and his judgment is coming. It's been promised. The author of Hebrews even challenges those who were thinking because it, it was hard to follow Jesus. Is it hard to follow Jesus? Anybody found it hard? Have you found that even in our culture that's somewhat protected, how the mocking and the ridiculing and the stuff goes on, the, the persecution, it's not like other parts of the world, but it's, it's growing. And you feel like it's really hard to follow Jesus. And that's what they felt, except in that day they were being imprisoned and some were being killed. And so they're thinking, maybe this Jesus thing isn't right. I'm going to go back to something else. And he says this, if we go on sinning willfully, referring to rejecting the offer of the gospel, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. He says, if you set aside the law of Moses, how much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? And this is what God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. He concludes, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Jonathan Edwards preached a simple message. He went out and talked about sinners in the hands of an angry God. He preached that message in a monotone, hardly even looking at the people, because he didn't want his personality to influence anyone. He just told the truth of a razor-thin thread that was holding them over the precipice of hell, and they're about to fall in, and they must repent. See, there's a war going on, folks. If you're not a Christian, your war is with God. If you're a Christian, your war is with the devil. But there's always a war, right? Whose team do you want to be on? See, I want to make sure I've got on my shoes of the gospel of peace. Not a gospel of works. Not a gospel of self-righteousness. Not a gospel of religion. That's not good news. That won't save. That won't work. The good news is we have peace with God. Well, what does this have to do with our shoes? Now, I want to show you another picture. When I threw the javelin, I had to wear these funny boots. And you see the spikes on the bottom of those? We did those, and those are the short spikes. We also had long ones that were about an inch long. We had the short ones if we were on a tartan run up runway, we would run up, and it was a rubberized runway, and you would run and just have enough to see so your foot stuck in the thing, and then you could whip and throw. Probably why I have a bad back today. But on grass, we had even longer spikes. Why? Because you don't want to slip. You slip exerting that much thrust, and you're going to just tear everything apart, which probably is what happened too. So anyway, <laughs> I've never met a javelin thrower that doesn't have a bad back. Anyway, look at how, what the Roman soldiers wore. See those things on the bottom? Now, that's just an artist's rendering or a thing, but they would actually have spikes Leather sandals, one piece of leather with uh, spikes going through a rubberized thing and a place in between to protect the bottom of their feet. Why? So that in fighting, they could what? Stand firm. 
if you are going to war against an enemy, and we're talking about hand-to-hand combat, that's what Paul's describing in Ephesians 6. He's not talking about Satan's on the other side of the world and his demons are in Mexico or somewhere. He's talking about you are in a hand-to-hand battle personally with demonic forces. And when that happens, what happens if you slip and fall? You're gone. And every soldier knew that. And so Paul says, for you to be able to stand firm and not slip, to not have your feet give out from under you, for you to be stable so you can stand and resist the enemy, you've got to have the right shoes on. You have to have your feet shod to be bind under, to strap on a sandal that a Roman soldier wore. It provided two main things, protection, Because what the enemy would do in that day is they would go out into the field where you were about to march and they would stick little spikes up coming out of the ground and then cover them over with leaves and things. Kind of like uh, landmines today in our modern warfare. These things would be out there and as you walked out there, if you stepped on one, it goes through your foot. Are you any good for battle after that? You're gone. So they had to have these very thick, heavy-duty leather with rubber type things, these sandals on that would protect their feet. But it was also for stability, so they wouldn't sleep or slip. So notice what he says here, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That Greek word means readiness, but it can also mean firmness. So what am I doing? I am shodding my feet so I can stand firm with a firm belief that I am at peace with God. And nothing can change that. Now, I'm bringing this up over and over again because I know so many of you are struggling with this. You've told me. There are times you doubt your salvation. There are moments you wonder if you're really a child of God. There are moments you think God is mad at you and something's going on in your life because he just wants to destroy you. You're thinking, I can't even talk to him anymore because he doesn't like me. Am I right? This is where the enemy attacks. He hasn't had to change his strategy in thousands of years. It works unless you have anchored your feet in the ground with full traction in a belief that I am at peace with God, and that will never change. See, the gospel of peace, Romans 5, therefore having been justified by faith, that's the breastplate of righteousness, having been, past tense, ongoing, that'll never change. I have been justified by faith with this breastplate of righteousness. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into the grace in which we stand. That's the shoes of the gospel of peace. I've been justified entirely by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And because of that, I have righteousness. But I also stand firm in the grace of God that I am forevermore his child. This has got to be believed. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, you know the great chapter about the resurrection? which, by the way, most people miss the whole point of it. The whole point of the chapter is in the last verse. It's all about being able to be steadfast and movable, always amounting in the work of the Lord. That's the only command in the entire passage. 57 verses of instruction, one verse of command. You are supposed to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That's that's the conclusion. But leading up to that is the gospel. And in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, He says this, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. See, Luther understood that. Martin Luther, as he was launching the Reformation and carrying on the work of some previous reformers, he got up there and he started proclaiming the truth. He got in a lot of trouble. They bring him to the Diet of Worms. You don't want to say worms because then it's just kind of gross, right? So he comes to this debate and he communicates what he believes and they're attacking him. And what does he say? Here I stand. I can do no other. I can't change the gospel. I can't change the message. I don't have the right to change the word of God. I'm going to stand in it, though, no matter what you may do to me. He stood in the gospel of peace. How does this help against Satan? Let me just cover four things here real quick, and we'll wrap this up. Number one, because of this gospel of peace, I have assurance of victory and salvation. I have peace with God. I never need to doubt my salvation. I don't have to look for peace. I have it. Amen? You're at peace with God. This is great news. Secondly, I have assurance of victory in trials. Why? Because I have the peace of God. 
Think about that. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. That's the key, folks. If I know I'm at peace with God and he's not mad at me, whatever circumstances I'm praying about that are tending to make me anxious, it's not because he's mad. He loves me. He forgives me. He may have to discipline me here and there, but not out of anger. It's always out of love, right? Hebrews chapter 12. So I'm not anxious for anything, but prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let my request be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I'm in a trial. The devil's attacking me. You're in this trial because God hates you. You're in this trial because you're a loser. You're in this trial because you're not a Christian. Your circumstances, you deserve this. You deserve this. You deserve this. You know what, Satan, you're right. I do deserve anything and everything I get. That's why I rely on grace. I'm not asking for justice. I'm asking for mercy. And, and God has said that I have his peace. I'm at peace with him, and I have his peace in my heart right now, no matter what you may say. That leads then to assurance of victory in relationships, having peace with people. We read in Ephesians 2, you can go to Romans 14, and I'm not going to do anything that causes my brother to stumble. I'm not going to do that because why? I want to have peace. I want to have peace with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Galatians 3.28 there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. We all came to salvation the same way, right? Is anybody here better than somebody else? We're all equal. We have different functions, but we're all equal. And so here we are having peace with each other. Look around the room. These folks are not your enemies. Think about that. And don't tell me they're over in the kids' building right now either. That's not true. <laughs> they're not your enemies. They're not your enemies. You do not battle with flesh and blood. Amen? Peace is available. Is peace always available? Of course it's always available. That's why we should go out and be peacemakers. Peace. Number four, assurance of victory and intimate partnership. Now here's where it gets really cool. We have peace with God. We have the peace of God. We have peace with other people. But then there's this promise. When you're walking in the truth, the God of peace himself will be with you. So he's already with me. Yeah, but he'll be with you in a growing, deepening way. That's where you get to in verse 9 of Philippians 4, where he says, there are the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 6 and 7, I get the peace of God. Verse 9, I get the God of peace. He ministers to me. And by the way, this phrase, God of peace, shows up all over the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. Hebrews 13.20.21, 20, Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen! The God of peace who's at peace with you is going to work in you and through you. You can't stop him. How about this one, though? Romans 16.20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. You hear that promise? The God of peace who's at peace with you knows who your real enemy is. And the day coming, he's going to crush him. Just like he promised back in Genesis 3.15. When he gave that first gospel message and he says, you know what? The seed, the, the, the seed of the, the, the serpent there, the devil himself, is going to bruise Jesus on the heel, but Jesus is going to crush his head. He's going to deliver a death blow. That's coming. Revelation chapter 20, and the devil is going to be thrown into lake and fire where he is going to suffer forever and ever and ever. Is he going to be crushed? This war is going to end. You're not at war with God. You are at war with the devil, but the one you're not at war with guarantees victory. Isn't that great news? I love this. I just love thinking about this piece. Hebrews 2, Jesus is our sympathetic high priest who's going to come alongside, and he has the power of death. The devil did, but Jesus rendered him powerless. You don't need to be fearful of death anymore. Revelation 20 already mentioned. So what? How do we wrap this up? To stand against the attacks of the devil in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is, an, en this is a, a, an enemy smarter than you more experienced than you, more powerful than you, and you can't see him. But you have resources. You have the feet 
protected by the gospel of peace. You are absolutely convinced. Are you? Are you absolutely convinced right now that you are at peace with God? If you were on your deathbed right now and about to take your last breath, would there be any hesitation? Would there be any fear? Would there be any concern that maybe I haven't done enough? If that's the case, then you're still part of that religious group that's on a broad path to destruction. You must wholeheartedly rest in the fact that Jesus paid it all. And you are at peace because of that. I could die right now. Could you? Could you die right now and just go, Lord, take me. I'm ready. You can be with the shoes of the gospel of peace. One of Satan's chief tactics is to try to convince you that you're the enemy of God, that he's not your father. Lloyd-Jones said, if I'm in doubt about my salvation, I shall not be able to fight the enemy. I shall have to spend the whole of my time struggling with myself. The Christian must be clear about his relationship to God. So what do you do practically? Here's what you do. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Do we need the gospel every day? Every moment of every day? Fascinating. Think about this with me for a moment. Have you ever read the book of Romans? Raise your hands if you read the book of Romans. You ever read the book of Romans? Paul's most detailed gospel presentation anywhere in the New Testament detailed about condemnation, justification, sanctification, glorification, and the practical outworkings of that. All about the gospel. But mark this. He wrote it to Christians. Second Timothy, the last book Paul writes to his number one protege, the one he said, I've got nobody else like him. This man's a kindred spirit. This guy's got it. He is committed. He's faithful. He's a fellow soldier. Timothy is right on. And he writes the very last letter to him. And over and over and over again, he reminds Timothy of the gospel. Timothy, you're struggling. You're fearful. You're ashamed. Doggone it, Timothy. Go back and remind yourself that Jesus Christ paid it all. You are washed. You are clean. You are right with God. There's no more war. You are with him forever. And he will fulfill everything he's promised to you, Timothy. So you just keep going, my friend. Embrace suffering like I have. I'm about to die. Carry the torch. Amen? You can't do that if you doubt. You've got to have it anchored in your soul. When the enemy attacks me, Satan, I am a child of God. I am at peace. The war is over, and it will never start up again. Then you can win. Are you firm? Are you sure? If you're a true follower of Jesus Christ, you have peace with God. You can, because of that, experience the peace of God. You can then labor to have fellowship with others and have peace with one another. And you can have the God of peace draw closer and closer and closer to you entirely by his grace. Amen? And one more verse. I'll read it again. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. Plant those feet firm. Stand on Jesus Christ. He is our peace. Father, we thank you for this reminder. We know these things, but so often in the midst of the battle we forget. We know that we are justified, and because we're justified, we have peace with you. But there are times, Lord, we have to admit that we struggle, and the enemy attacks, and he brings lies to us. But Father, that's not even my greatest concern. My greater concern would be for anyone here today who has falsely believed they're right with you because they do religious things. Oh, Lord, open their eyes to see Jesus is our peace. It's him alone, what he has done alone, that makes us right with you. Oh, Lord, if there's anybody here who's not done that, would you please draw them to yourself right now? Give them repentance, give them faith. Enable them to respond to the call of Jesus to come to him, those who are weary and heavy laden, that he would give them rest. They could experience the shalom of God being right with you forevermore. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.